we have to figure out ways to communicate information, not just to radiologists and doctors and nurses, but directly to patients. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Radiology Report podcast, where we are having conversations with the leaders transforming radiology today. You can find us on radiologyreportpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Daniel Arnold. I'm so excited to welcome Shiv Garglani to the Radiology Report podcast today. Shiv is the CEO and co-founder of Osmosis, as well as the host of the very popular Raise the Line podcast. Shiv completed an undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering at Harvard, and then went on to study to get his MD from John Hopkins and MBA from Harvard before pouring himself full-time into building Osmosis. Osmosis is an online, all-in-one health education platform for MDs, DOs, PAs, NPs, and more looking to learn efficiently. Shiv is both a personal friend from Harvard Business School and a mentor to me as he successfully built Osmosis into one of the leading online health education platforms on the market. Shiv, welcome to the show. Daniel, it's great to great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Absolutely. So uh, tell us about yourself and your journey into healthcare entrepreneurship. You know, I'm curious, especially to hear what was the, the fork in the road moment for you decide between pursuing a clinical career versus a business career full time? And uh, how'd you make that call? Yeah, no, good question. So, so I come from a family of clinicians. My dad's a retired physician who ran a hospital in South Africa. My mother's a physical therapist and my sister is a dentist and brother-in-law is a dentist too. They have six dental practices in Chicago. And so I'm sort of the black sheep in that I never actually finished uh, my clinical degree or medical degree. Uh, I'm on leave. Uh, we'll get back to that in a bit. But it was sort of growing up with all this healthcare around me. I got very interested in it clearly because I was exposed to it. I saw how much gratification and value my parents got from their clinical careers obviously stressors too, but it was uh, very meaningful to them. I met their patients and realized it was a career that I could see myself dedicating my, uh, my life to. And then when I got to Hopkins Med School, uh, fully intending to finish and become a doctor, within the first month, I realized with my co-founder, Ryan, that we were forgetting things almost as quickly as we were learning them. And so we were worried looking ahead four years of medical school that this was not an efficient way of learning. And we were sort of teaching people the same way that had been taught decades earlier. And so started tinkering on just what would eventually become osmosis. And the fork in the road really for us was a year and a half into med school before entering clinical year, we decided to apply to a tech incubator to see if the couple hundred students at Hopkins who were using and loving osmosis would be interested uh, in expanding or more people beyond Hopkins would be interested in it. And we did a tech incubator, got a lot of traction through that, and then decided to keep deferring med school. And obviously, I went to business school where I met and became friends with you. Amazing. So what is Osmosis? Who is Osmosis core customer and how does it help them? Totally. Yeah. So Osmosis began just for second year or first and second year med students, right? So physiology, pathophysiology, it was just a learning platform where students could crowdsource content. They could upload documents in private workspaces and say, hey, I'm going to take Professor Smith's lecture and you take Professor uh, Jane's lecture. And we would write questions and share those with each other. And that's partly why we call it osmosis, is that knowledge diffuses not just from professor to student, but between students. Hmm. And so it's very much a tech platform without a real content strategy. Fast forward to business school, actually, we didn't gain a bunch of traction. We were a profitable company generating maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars in revenue with just that kind of platform. Then fast forward when I was in business school, one of the biggest inflection points for us was I recruited the team that used to run Khan Academy Health and Medicine uh, because we realized we needed a content strategy. We had to build great videos and not the Khan Academy scratchy text videos, but like very nice graphics, trained medical illustrators, you know, you need to be able to see things and visualize them, but maybe not in 3D, maybe like a, a 2D kind of warm color palette. And so that was the real innovation of producing these types of videos, which ultimately became very popular. We became the largest uh, health education channel on YouTube. We now have over 2,500 videos that are about three to 10 minutes long on everything from uh, basic physiology to pathophysiology to procedural skills, like how to actually we have a video on how to read chest x-rays. Uh, we obviously should do more in radiology, and maybe that's uh, something we can talk about later. And the customer base has expanded as a result from just medical students to being physical therapy, pharmacy, dentistry, nursing, et cetera. 
We have a couple hundred thousand practicing professionals who've used osmosis. We have continuing education, CME. And then we even have pre-medical and, and actually three high schools that have contracts for osmosis access for AP bio and anatomy as well. So the vision really is everyone who cares for someone will learn about osmosis. And one of the things that gets me most excited is actually patient comments on our videos because they're so accessible that people who care about themselves, their bodies, their children uh, have been using osmosis to learn too. Amazing. When you first got started though, and you know, it's amazing to see how far you've come and you were just serving a few hundred students at Hopkins. What was it like making the leap from sort of a few people using it to, okay, we're actually reaching people at scale. Like how did you get from zero to one and and get those initial bits of traction? And what were some of the the tactics that you took and what were some of the um, inflection points that made you think, hey, there's something here, like something big enough that, you know, I really got to think about pursuing this full time, you know, beyond just maybe a hobby while I'm in, in med school. Yeah, it's interesting. So I love zero to one. That's obviously a great term and a great book by Peter Thiel that has a lot of learnings in it. Zero to one really is me is like the founder. Like as if you're the customer, you're the one uh, initially. So we were really genuinely passionate about building this for ourselves just to learn medicine more efficiently. So even if it was just me and Ryan, zero to two, really, we would have been happy. But the thing is, we realized very soon by building this thing, some of our closest friends at Hopkins became our first test people. So one one like killer feature of the mobile app that we built was it sends you a push notification with an actual question. This was early, right? So before mm-hmm. push notifications were done as annoyingly as they are now, it was still kind of new. So the app sent you a push notification. So if you learn about cystic fibrosis today, tomorrow you're getting a question about cystic fibrosis via the app push mm-hmm. notification. The way I beta tested that at Hopkins was I literally would text message five of my friends every day and like text them a question with A, B, C, D, E. And the engagement just from the text messages was great. And I would send them a couple a day and then they'd be like, can you send me more? Like, this is really cool. It's like a personal digital assistant teaching me this stuff. And so that was like one of the initial growth hacks is like, it clearly was like a mechanical Turk, right? If you're familiar with the concept where there was no real algorithms, there's no real software is me texting people. It's what Paul Graham says, do things that don't scale. And then we released it we made it clear as a beta. That's a growth tactic is to tell people like to lower expectations. <laughs> not an alpha, so like don't kill us for this. Because a startup has three limitations. Obviously, everyone knows the first two. It's time and money. The third limitation is first impressions. So people don't think about that. That is if you launch too soon or if you're like, this is a great product, you build too many features and have feature creep, you don't know who your audience is. You can really alienate, alienate a lot of people. And you may just have to rebrand because your, you know, your first impression wasn't good. When we started knowing we had some traction was when we released it to Hopkins Med students, the engagement was great. Like everyone was using it. Uh, we we're getting really positive qualitative and quantitative feedback. Then two months after releasing, we got, we started getting cold emails and Facebook messages back when people used Facebook saying, Hey, like my friends at Hopkins use this. I'm at Tufts. I'm at Northwestern. Could we get this at our school? So similar to the evolution of Facebook, we started hearing from students at other great schools who wanted to use it. And that's what made us decide to take time off and do this tech incubator, which was very low risk. They gave us money. It was high equity at the time, but they gave us money. They gave us mentorship. The plan B was always, oh, if this doesn't work, we can go back and finish med school and become doctors and make our parents proud. Um, But we decided, you know, what was the criteria for whether it worked or not was within four months of the tech incubator, we went from having maybe 300 registered learners on osmosis to over 5,000. Um, and we started making actual revenue and decided to take more time to, to keep building it. Amazing. I don't know if my head of product, Mike, is listening, but if he could go into the website and add beta behind MRN line, that might be helpful for us because not a day goes by that the site doesn't feel like a beta for some. So I think that's a smart hack. Okay, so so you you go to business school, you you've got some traction, you're starting to think this thing is possible and it's starting to take off. I'm curious to hear of any stories where maybe they weren't up and to the right, because I think every founder listening to you is like, man, this guy should have figured it all out. Like start something when you're in med school, drop out and you know, profit. But tell us about some of the more uh, challenging periods that you hit. Yeah, and no, totally. It's so many of them. And, and you know, one thing is there's this narrative fallacy, right? We're like looking back. Yeah, of course, we made this decision, that decision that, you know, and so looking back, it's easy to connect the dots, as they say, but looking forward, you don't know how the dots are going to connect because there's so many things that are out of your control 
you know, we right before we started this podcast, we talked about a travel startup that like when COVID hit, you know, it kind of killed a lot of travel startups. And then for online learning and healthcare companies, it did pretty well for us uh, in terms of increasing demand. And so for us, very specifically, a couple of things. One is we confused what real traction is. If you're a startup, real traction is creating value for your customers and then capturing some of that value, normally in the form of revenue. And so we got distracted by shiny objects, like a lot of companies do. You kind of have to explore and, and find the shiny objects. But then once you've found one and it's working, you need to really focus on ex exploiting it, explore versus exploit. And so for us, we like very early went into osmosis for aviation because we got we won this EdTech award. We thought that was the point of a startup to win these awards, to get fundraising a bit. And that was not the point of a repeatable scalable business model. And we kind of knew this rationally, but we it's still hard. It's like rationally, you know, it doesn't matter, but then you still get pulled into these applications and this rat race and these tech crunch articles and stuff like that. So we got a little um, distracted by some of that. And then that led to more distractions because then the more well-known we were getting in the ed tech space, the more inbounds we were getting saying, hey, could you do this for pilots? Could you do hmm. this for SAT, ACT prep? So we literally had, before we had 100,000 in revenue and 10,000 users, we had Osmosis Aviation launched. And <laughs> there's no Osmosis Aviation. That's a spoiler alert. That is not exist. <laughs> so uh, very much fell into that trap. Number two, competitors emerge. So if you're onto something and competitors emerge, oftentimes uh, that can be very discouraging, especially the first time founders. But really the way to look at it, I find now I have a much healthier relationship with competition one, it's not a zero-sum game, right? Competitors are helping you create your market. So now that we, there's a very robust health education market, they're showing what's possible with successful exits, with fundraising. So there's a real market there. They're advertising about some of these same concepts, flip classroom, online learning, and normalizing it in ways that if you were just doing it yourself, you may not have the funding to do it. So they're helping create the market. So it's not a zero-sum game. They're helping create the market. And sometimes you can collaborate very effectively with them. Like we never burn bridges. You know, the company mm -hmm. that wound up acquiring us is Elsevier. We could have viewed them as a competitor early on. And we probably did, but we never burned bridges. We never, you know, were shady with them or anything. And then fast forward a couple of years later, they remember that, we remember that, and they bought us. Uh, and I try to act the same way with all sorts of competitors. But I will say back in the day, I would get discouraged when a new competitor would emerge or a company, a larger company would copy what we were doing. And that's why having a co-founder is helpful because if you have a co-founder who balances not only your skill sets, but maybe your temperament, uh, you can kind of find a nice equilibrium where when you're down, they're medium or up and vice versa and kind of go through it together because it's, it's, it's a roller coaster. It's pretty difficult to do. I love those stories and uh, ones that I'll definitely share with my team. You bring up a little bit about the competition piece of it, and, and, and it, it's just amazing how much the industry has changed since you got started in the field. You know, I've been in it now five years. You've been in it maybe closer to seven to 10, something like that. And it all seems like you said, fait accompli, that this was how this industry would emerge. But but some of what you did was was pretty cutting edge at the time. And, um, you know, certainly people like Khan have paved the way for us, but I'm just kind of curious, zooming out a bit, like how has this industry of medical education changed? I'm, you know, what were people saying to you 10 years ago versus today? And, you know, what, what are some of those big trends? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so online learning as a whole, ed tech in general, online learning is obviously accepted. It's probably like where online dating was in the nineties and two thousands, where it was mm. still a bit, oh, why are you online? Like, what are you, can't you meet somebody at a bar in real life or church or something? And then, you know, obviously now online dating is the norm for a lot of people with at least smartphone apps and stuff. Same thing with online education, right? It was just, it's just seemed like, why are you doing that? Are you doing that to kind of, are you cheating? Are you, you know, Hmm. And there's still some of that going on, but like it's become kind of the norm, especially as the broader, the rising tide has raised all boats in ed tech, right? We have large publicly traded companies like Coursera that have paved the way for Khan Academy, a nonprofit, that have paved the way for a lot of this digital first online learning. So when I go into schools, I don't do that as much anymore. Actually, I still do. I'm back to the roots now, post acquisition of being able to go and talk to customers directly, which I love. Uh, and being a customer myself, which again, we can get into that the conversations when we were starting were very much like, why do we need an extra resource? Or like, what is flip classroom? Like lectures are great. This is how we've been doing it for a hundred years. Why are we changing the lecture format? 
now it's very much accepted that that's not pedagogically correct, right? A 60 minute talking head is not the best way to learn, right? You want to keep, at least keep that shorter, if not make it more active learning, add some questions and interactivity, have some simulations and cases. So I think the state of the art is the schools, the admins, the faculty, in your case, program directors, chief medical officers, et cetera, they truly understand the science of learning better than they did a decade ago. And again, that's because of, I think, competition, people creating all this content to train people how to be better teachers. Another thing is, I think there's been a realization that the, you know, people have been talking about the physician and nurse shortage for many years, uh, decades even. And because of COVID, things have become a lot worse. So there's been this realization that we have to scale health education more efficiently than we have currently. There's There just won't be enough seats in residency programs or in medical schools and mm -hmm. nursing schools to meet the demands, especially with the aging demographic, with infectious diseases coming out, et cetera. So we have to figure out ways to communicate information, not just to radiologists and doctors and nurses, but directly to patients. And so there's been a much more of a widespread acceptance, I think, of asynchronous online learning for all those applications across healthcare, which has helped us, again, kind of expand more horizontally than just vertical medicine. Yeah, I agree with all that. You know, Some of the things that I've seen in terms of how the industry has changed around that acceptance is users understanding that nothing takes away from in-person learning and collaboration. Uh, you and I were both engineering majors. We also did business school. So much that you get of teamwork, collaboration, in-person project doing, you can't replace that, certainly clinical rotations. But a lot of, of learning, like just rote learning can be done better online through short videos, interactivity in our field, you get to do simulation, multiple choice questions, like just all of those are proven to have better outcomes. And so if you can pair up the best of what you can do with technology with the best of what you can achieve in person. I think everyone's realizing that achieves better, better outcomes. Some of the other things that have changed a lot is just how much easier it is to get started. I mean, the, the proliferation of these SaaS tools, you know, I got to our first million in revenue without ever hiring an engineer. And um, you couldn't do that certainly, you know, even a decade ago. And, and, and so the field has changed so much. And then, like you mentioned, the competition is good. And I think people think it's scary, but it's like, no, no, no. If, if they're competition is good, it's a huge market. Uh, healthcare is a multi-trillion dollar global market. And, you know, education is key to driving the outcomes that we all want. And so it's going to be a key piece of that puzzle. You know, I love what you talk about with, with this raise the line concept. And, you know, I don't think I ever understood it as clearly until you just said it that way. And, and we've started to see this too within our customer base. So one of the number one reasons people are using MRI online is, I don't have enough radiologists to meet the demands. And so me as a group needs to find a way to take on more than I did in the past. And like, yeah, I know this doctor doesn't know, wasn't classically trained and had to do cardiac CT, but patients need the cardiac CT and I got to do it effectively. And I think that's maybe an example of that raise the line thinking. So um, I'm wondering if you can share a bit about what this concept of raise the line means to you and um, how osmosis does it. Yeah. And so that concept was born out of March, 2020 when the pandemic hit, right? We if you zoom back to that terrible time, we kept hearing the term flatten the curve, right? So everyone suddenly knew what an epidemiological curve was and what they looked like. And so what could you do to flatten the curve? You wear a mask, you socially distance, physically distance. Now you get vaccinated, you do preventative medicine things, right? So that you don't overwhelm the healthcare system because again, we didn't have enough ventilators. We didn't have enough ICU attendings to be able to take care of patients. So that was flattened the curve. The other part of it though, is what we say, raising the line. So raising the line represents healthcare capacity. So how do we increase healthcare capacity? In the early stages of the pandemic, that was clearly you know more masks, more ventilators, more physicians and nurses. Um, but also there's a whole host of other things to strengthen the healthcare system. There's telehealth. There was uh, the education we talk about. It's a big theme. Even diversity, equity, and inclusion is part of that too, where, you know, how do we create pathways so that people, you know, who live in rural Arkansas decide to go to med school in rural Arkansas and then stay in rural Arkansas to provide care to that population? Because as we've seen, especially with the COVID pandemic, you know, a lot of these health systems have shut down in these rural areas. So a lot of the diversity, equity, inclusion stuff related to race and line isn't just race and gender. It's also socioeconomic. It's also just geographic distribution. So that's the concept of raising line. That's why we launched that podcast very shortly after the pandemic began. Our first guest was actually Tom Frieden, who ran the CDC. And then we had like, I've had a host of awesome other guests. 
And we've categorized these 300 or so episodes we've done, including yours, into 10 different categories, one of which is, you know, how do we train more healthcare professionals more efficiently? Another is how do we deliver a care with different models where this fee for service model we've known has not worked that well for the past several decades in terms of cost containment and quality. And so um, part of the silver lining of the pandemic was that a lot of uh, value-based models and direct to consumer models of healthcare delivery and access have become much more popular, uh, right? So we saw that spike in companies and systems and health plans adopting not just telehealth, but digital health, remote patient monitoring, mm-hmm. And now the biggest trend is healthcare at home. How do we deliver care at home uh, so it's less expensive than, say, in a in a tertiary care center and an ICU bed, et cetera? Really amazing. As part of your podcast now, having interviewed hundreds of guests from Mark Cuban to, to Chelsea Clinton to me, what have you learned about podcasting and interviewing? <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been great. I mean, like I. I, I love the job. I think it's um, it's like one one role I play. Obviously, do a lot of other things for osmosis, but you know, being able to spend thirty minutes with someone and like ask them any questions and learn their story, it's you know not only made me a better listener, it's uh, given me insights. A lot of the people we bring on are partners or, or deans of med schools and nursing schools that have adopted or will adopt osmosis uh, or else your products. And so just learning about what their challenges are, it helps you stay one foot ahead of the game and and understand what type of courses we should work on and develop and connect those dots. You know, my producer is a guy named Michael. He's also a co-host. You met him when you were on the podcast. He's great. And one thing he keeps trying to teach me is the need to carry a nice microphone wherever I go because I travel so much. (laughs) Uh, And so there's logistical (laughs) aspects of I care a lot about Wi-Fi wherever I stay now. If I'm <laughs> podcasts, uh, podcasts go well. So hopefully this one's working well for your audience. Yeah. So so late last year, uh, your company was acquired by Elsevier. How is the company and how has your role evolved under Elsevier's ownership? Yeah. I mean, so we had a lot of options last year where do we raise a Series B, go venture route? Do we do private equity? Do we grow profitably independently? Or do we do a strategic sale, which we wound up doing? And, um, you know, regardless, my plans for the future were evolving and I hired a COO named Derek Apanovich, who's still our COO, he's wonderful. Um, and our VP of people, Hillary Acer, who basically helped scale our culture and team, you know, before she joined, we had five or 10 people. She built the processes for recruiting, for growing that helped us go from you know, 10 people to a hundred people. It was really effective at that. So between those two, they basically run the day-to-day of the company, the management, they hire. I interview people just because I want to still know who's joining the company and share values with them and uh, introduce them to the company and be accessible. But, you know, they're basically running the day-to-day show, which has freed me up to do what I love to do, which is be a customer, right? So I use the product a lot. Again, I have plans to do it even more. I travel a lot for conferences, but also I was just in Portugal uh, last month, I was in Israel a couple months ago for the first time, visiting our clients and visiting our prospective clients, just meeting with them, hearing what they're doing, being a brand ambassador for Osmosis and Elsevier. So doing a lot of business development on the ground, the podcasting, obviously with thought leadership, and then special projects and initiatives. So I have this major initiative that I've, I'm launching. It's like a startup within Osmosis, within Elsevier called the Year of the Zebra. Uh, which is about rare disorders. It's super excited about it because I, I very much, I like the zero to one to 10. Like, that's great. Like, I like all those. But I think the zero to one is just this element of being able to create something to turn it into action is much more my strong suit and skill set. Rather like, you know, selling the first 20 med schools versus the next 200 med schools. It's just a different skill set. And I like the zero to one aspect of the year of the zebra too. So uh, it's been great. And I love Elsevier because they've been so flexible, allowing me to do what I can uniquely contribute in my unique skill set. When you shared with me a few weeks ago, when we were chatting about the year of the zebra, I got very excited. You know, as I understood the the cause, there are hundreds of rare disorders that, you know, individually, each disorder may only impact hundreds or thousands of patients, but collectively it's hundreds of millions of people. And what, what typically happens when someone has one of these zebra cases, it can take them months or even years to get diagnosed, causing immense pain for patients and, and downstream harm to the system. And so, you know, is there more we can do to educate people about these zebra cases? I love the initiative and I think imaging plays a key role. So often imaging is is one of the key pieces where you can 
you know, early on identify those zebras. So I think it's an area that, that we'll collaborate and hopefully we can contribute some, some really amazing cases and thoughts from our faculty on how to better diagnose those cases. Yeah, I mean, that's where I love what you guys do. And I've been a fan for, for some years as well, ever since we started talking, um, because, you know, you are on the front lines of a lot of diagnostics and you're training people to make more accurate diagnoses and then other people who weren't necessarily trained in a specific area of radiology modality or part of the body to become trained in that area, right? So you're raising the line in that way. And one very specific example, since we're on the topic of zebras or disorders and radiology, is uh, I had this guy on our podcast, Philippe Pachter, the CEO of Elsevier, Kumsal Baez, that put me in touch directly with him. His daughter, Lizianne, has a rare uh, condition called Pierre Robin sequence, which uh, when they looked at the ultrasounds when she was uh, obviously in the womb, an experienced sonographer would have noticed the facial abnormalities and changes that would have come with Pierre Robin sequence. But unfortunately, it's not a very common condition, so uh, it was missed. And because it was missed, she was born in a normal maternity ward in France. Uh, they're living in Europe and uh, was not able to get the right treatment right away versus just a couple hundred miles away in Germany was a center where there are people who mm -hmm. know how to treat patients. And Pierre, she's doing fine. She's five-year-old, so it worked out. But it was such a big issue for them like not to have that diagnosis and the correct you know understanding of what, what was coming. So it freaked them out. It cost a ton more money than it should have. They're still kind of fighting the French government to get some of that remuneration to be able to, you know, have transferred to Germany for the proper care. And then it was bad for her as a, as a patient because it took them a long time to get the proper diagnosis and then treatment when, again, if that one sonographer had, had known or used the tool, maybe you guys have a module on that kind of stuff, they could have shared, saved a lot of pain, suffering, and money. Well, uh, everyone has a story of how getting the right diagnosis could have maybe changed the trajectory of their care. And, and, and that's, you know, an especially moving one. So if there's something we can do to, to help there, you know, we'd love to be a part of it. Finally, last question for you. Lots of listeners of the show are sort of aspiring business leaders. Many, many of them are radiologists who might also be thinking about starting a business. Any advice for starting a company in, in healthcare? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a really good question. So my general meta advice for this advice question is you can find advice for anything. You can find advice that you should be focused. You can find advice that you should be exploratory, right? So it's, advice is very contextual. Two pieces of advice that I think are really effective and kind of transcend context. One is read, like read a lot, right? Like these, a lot of these problems you're facing in business or in, uh, in medicine or whatever, whatever problems you're facing, someone else has gone through them, right? We've had, we have 7 billion people in the world right now. We've had tens of billions more in the course of history. Many of them have written amazing books and stories about things they've been through. If you can find the right stuff to read or listen to, you know, you can find the right advice and the right path forward. So that's what's one kind of high level piece of advice. The second is relationship building. I think relationships matter more than anything else, more than your rank account, more than like really anything. And if you're able to build relationships and work on that skill, not only are you able to attract teammates who then wind up becoming more than teammates, they become friends and lifelong lifelong friends. And we've been fortunate to have that at Osmosis. You attract partners. Many of my customers, initial customers are, again, very good lifelong friends. Our first B2B partner or second B2B partner just texted me yesterday with a picture of a second child. We're meeting up later this week. And investors, advisors, also, it all comes down to relationships. And are you a high integrity operator who people like to work with or be around? So I'd say reading and relationships are the two kind of transcendental pieces of advice I would give anybody. The other piece is just, you know, take action, right? So if you're going to spend 40 minutes or 30 minutes listening to a podcast with a random guy named Shiv, take the time to find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Shiv Rulani on LinkedIn. Send me a note, add me and, uh, if, if there's something I can be helpful with, please feel free to, to let me know. So having a bias towards action where you just spent, again, 30, 40 minutes of your life that you'll never get back listening to me drone on about advice, you should take the action and just at least connect with me and tell me uh, how much you did or didn't enjoy my droning. Well, I enjoyed the droning, Shiv, and uh, echo the advice. Shiv Gaglani, thanks for coming on the show. Daniel, a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Radiology Report podcast. Be sure to visit us at the radiology report podcast.com or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts to join us for our next episode. We are always looking for great guests 
If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please get in touch with us online.